On this episode of Big Boys Don't Cry, we discuss the films Hocus Pocus and Hocus Pocus 2. You do not have to have seen either film to enjoy the podcast, but if you do listen without having seen them, just be aware there may be spoilers. Enjoy. Put a spell on you, cause you're mine. <laughs> you did. That's right. Feels good. Do you like my growly? My growly good old voice. screaming Jay Hawkins. He was the proper original yeah. scary Great. man singer, wasn't he? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the OG. Um, still one of my favourite songs to this day. That I love that song. And if you look at the videos of him doing it, they're all like terrifying, and they're like. It's so old that the only video footage is in black and white. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's truly brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And he was definitely the first pers- the first singer ever to get on stage and like roll out of a coffin and stuff. Yeah, now we've yeah, seen it a hundred like, times. But back amazing, then... amazing theatrics behind it all. Yeah, really great. Apart from being a great song as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I know lots of people like other versions of it, but no, that's the. It's the best one. Yeah. How are you anyway during our our spooky time of the year? I'm good, yeah. I'm feeling spooky. The pumpkins are out. You know, decoration decorations are starting to appear in our road as well. We've got one house that's really Excellent. gone for it. It's going I feel like in the next few years it's going to be like Christmas lights. People are going to start competing with this, aren't they? I hope so. I really want that. Yeah. Lots of animatronic skeleton stuff. Some of those 12-foot skeletons you see in America everywhere. That's what I, I'm hoping for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they really go for it over there, obviously, over here. Yeah. You talk, you talk to a lot of people, do you seen, feel like maybe it's even people our age, it sort of divides people. Some people are a bit like, oh, it wasn't really a thing when we were kids, so they're not that bothered. But if you have kids now, it's a massive thing. But like, I, started, I think I was starting to get into it and enjoy it more before we had kids. Welcome to the, you know, let's just talk about Halloween in general as a thing <laughs> before we talk That's about weird. Halloween films. That's but, yeah. yeah, no, we never did Halloween properly when I was a kid. It wasn't really a thing in in sort of the, where I grew up. Um, but I've always loved Halloween for the movies and for the general vibe. Um, and now as an adult, it's great. Get in, watch some spooky movies, hand out some sweets. Perfect. What, what more is there to like uh, to want from a holiday than scary movies? Exactly. It's it's a great holiday, and I it, a lot of people I think don't like it if people who are maybe a bit more sensitive to things that are scary in general. But I think there's something for everyone in Halloween. You know, even if you just want to goof around, you can goof around. Like a pumpkin doesn't have to be scary. No, no, exactly. Halloween doesn't have to be scary if if you don't want it to be you can you can lean into the the humorous and the silly elements of it instead um obviously i go all out horror yeah yeah I'm halloween at your down, house is scary i'm running around on the streets of sussex covered in blood literal blood <laughs> i go to an abattoir and cover myself in it halloween at your house is like yeah scream too rob knows what you did <laughs> last winter or whatever i'm 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 one of those <laughs> um real life scary houses made flesh that's what i'm like at halloween oh like in poltergeist no you know the ones where like the extreme haunted houses that adults go to oh right yeah yeah would you ever do that i don't know if i would do that probably because the people i feel like the kind of person who would do that is someone i wouldn't like but (laughs) you don't just know what i mean (laughs) yeah i mean there's one um there's one, isn't there, which is um, particularly nasty. Um, the the Macamy Manor, um, which is notorious it. because if you if you go on a tour there, then it was that you can win money if you survive an entire night. Um, you win right. like twenty grand if you survive an entire night, and no one's ever done it because basically he tortures them with like waterboarding and things like that. Oh right, so that's um, that's not like a sort of bit of light-hearted escape room type fun. That's actual torture. No, no, this is genuine actual torture. Um, but but the ones where it's just like a guy a guy wearing a zombie outfit with a knife going ah and jumping out at you. That's fun. Like yeah, going to the, going to the London dungeons, that kind of thing. Where it's it was that 
yeah, where, where it's that kind of spookiness, that, that's fun. It's when it goes into that extreme level that I'm like, no, the people doing this are just sadists. <laughs> that's all it is. I, I, do I have a photo somewhere of me. I think it's like my ninth or tenth birthday at the London Dungeon with me and my dad and one of my oh. friends. And like, I'm holding the axe and it looks like I'm chopping my dad's head off. And my memory oh, is that so like good. it was a very heavy real axe. <laughs> and it looks very real in the photo. I'll see if I can find it. I do, I do love those those um, the like London dungeons, and they're all over the place, aren't they? The different dungeons. They are um, now. They're yeah. always they're always fun and always silly. Um, I'm a big fan of that kind of tourist trap. Um, you know, going to a sea life centre, going to the dungeons. We went to a sea life centre together once, didn't we? We did, yeah. Down in I Brighton, feel like you, me, and Rob Sherman went to the Brighton Sea Life Centre once. Yeah, we did. It was amazing. Good time. I love the Sea Life Centre. Got some all rays. The, all, the, all the rays. Sharks. They got sharks there? They got sharks as well. Yeah. No, I love an aquarium. And Halloween is basically the joy you get from that kind of thing, but in a holiday that you can celebrate however you like. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Halloween um, is good. And this, and this week we're looking at one of the quintessential Halloween movies for a lot of people. Indeed, and I think people who are about our age, um, part of engaging with Halloween is through nostalgia and through watching kind of vaguely spooky stuff you might have watched and enjoyed when you were a kid, of which Hocus Pocus is one of those films. But I had never seen it until we watched it this week. So this is your first ever... I watched it when I was a kid. My first Pocus. Ah. (laughs) I watched it when I was a kid, but I think only like once. And then I rewatched it a few years ago, and then I watched it here. So again, it's not like a big, a big thing for me in terms of Halloween. It wasn't um, a Halloween tradition you... in the Gordon House. No, right? no. It you guys a... probably I mean... already on like a Nightmare on Elm Street by the time you were five, anyway. <laughs> well, the thing is that my my parents had never been horror movie fans, um, although I ended up watching quite a lot because of them not caring what I watched. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, but they've never been fans of horror movies. It's always been something I picked up on my own. All oh, right. I thought they might have influenced you in that. No, no, they they're not fans of horror at all. Um Interesting. something that I've I've picked up. Um but yeah, so we we never watched yeah, this this was something maybe we watched as a kid on TV. Um but yeah, never owned it and then yeah, hadn't watched it for years. And yeah, a rewatch now. So, did you enjoy your first? I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I was pleasantly surprised by by both of them. The first one and the second. One. We're going to talk about both. We talk about the first one mm, first. But yeah. as a, a, I was expecting it to not be good because of misplaced nostalgia, and then I was pleasantly surprised. So again, maybe my expectations were low, but I actually quite enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's one of those movies like Jumanji, where it's a kind of fantasy romp grounded in the real world where it very much appeals to maybe people younger than the main characters i'd say much in the same way that jumanji's the same way when you think about the oldest daughter in that um it's a sort of yeah it, it's like a really good movie for kids to watch to get them into that that sort of halloween mood um with some really you you can see why people loved it so much when they were younger and it's got that really good sort of um character dynamic and that yeah that those elements of fantasy into a sort of you know a, a disney movie setup which is which is what it is yeah absolutely and it was i i'm aware of it because the trailer for it was on almost every vhs that i owned in the 90s that was mm, like yeah. every every disney vhs i feel like the trailer for this was on it somewhere but it wasn't. It didn't do that well at the time initially, did it? It wasn't seen as like a success. It became a. Um, it became a cult movie over the years. So yeah, it made it made back its money almost double what it cost. But obviously, for a Disney film, that's not a success. For a Disney film in 1993, anything other than like quadrupling what you spent on it is is yeah is a failure. Yeah. Yeah, so like its box office wasn't wasn't great. It made it back. Um but it also didn't do too well with critics either. But then over time it's built up this reputation. And I think a lot of that has to do with Disney's kind of Disney's marketing, really, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, with that yeah. trailer being being on every VHS, I think it's probably through it having it around on VHS, renting it around Halloween, all of those kinds of things. It's a film that's easy to embed into a family nostalgia and halloween traditions so it doesn't matter if the critics don't like it 
Exactly, and and of course the syndication onto television. So like Disney Channel showing it, other channels showing it year in, year out. Um, much in the same way that um, Christmas movie that I've completely forgotten the name of. A Christmas Prince. <laughs> A Christmas Prince. Um, A Christmas Prince 2, the Royal Wedding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Christmas Prince 2. The Night Before um, Christmas with a K. Oh man, that was a that was a film. That was certainly um, a film. <laughs> I might actually rewatch that this year. There is so much terrible Christmas content this year. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> definitely. No, what's the what's the what's the classic one? The the great Christmas. The movie. Muppet it's Christmas completely... Carol. It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Oh yeah, yeah. How that was that was seen as a yeah. What didn't do well at the time then because it was on TV all the time. Yeah. yeah. But then it had that TV syndication. It was on every year and people recognised it and then it built up that nostalgia over time. Um, and yeah, this this um... that's over a much longer period of time, I think. But this is essentially course, the same thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of, of, of course, but it's a, it's a similar kind of thing where, and obviously, like having the power of Disney behind you certainly helps. Um, but it's it's good that it has, it did gain that, um, it did gain that love over time because it is a good movie, and I'm glad that people do enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very for happy, very happy for this to be part of the uh, the Halloween canon. Yes, yeah, um, and it's a fun, it's a fun story. It's three witches they get brought back by a virgin lighting a candle um in a rare moment of disney messaging being go and have sex so yeah. you don't bring back witches <laughs> um yeah and uh, i have to say they really did labor the joke of him being a virgin a bit too much if i'm yes, honest yeah that kind of dated <laughs> it, it a little bit that was a bit silly the very 90s um, uh, early 90s <laughs> extreme <humor. laughs> extremely virgin. 90s extremely 90s humor um and then um and then, yeah, hijinks and she when these three witches come back and they want to eat children's souls to gain their youth. Um, and then you've got the whole thing about them not recognising the world anymore because it's the modern world and Halloween's now a, a holiday rather than just a thing that happens. Um, and yeah, it's, it's good. It's a good film. I, I enjoy. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed rewatching it. Good, yeah. Me, me too. So the two... So talk talk us through the, the plot a little bit, but I want to ask you before you do, the two kind of schoolyard bullies who steal his shoes. You reckon? Do you reckon you could take them? I could one hundred percent take them. Yeah, me too. They are they are little dweebs. They would get an, a mega noogie. They're like from me. crab and goil dweebs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and one of them um, is actually plays one of like the jocks in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes, I thought I recognised, which is him. amazing. Like I, I saw because I I didn't notice it obviously when I first watched it, and I didn't notice it on the rewatch that I did a few years ago. But this time I was like. That guy looks familiar. So I looked him up and was like, yeah, he's one of the jocks in Buffy. That's brilliant. Yeah, um, He's got a good so, kind yeah. of jock face. But in this, what is he wearing? He's got that, is it like a pork pie hat? <laughs> he's, he's looking like, uh, I, I love the look of bullies in the 90s. He's friends and the other bullies like a, a goth metalhead guy. Like those yeah, guys Yeah, he's a metalhead. He's... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one of them looks like he sort of might, the, the pork pie hat guy, Ice. Ice. He, he he looks like he'd be um he he looks like he'd be a sort of um maybe an alternative kid. He kind of looks like he'd be into like Pearl Jam or something. Oh yeah. He? Yeah. And then you've got Jay who yeah looks like a Guns N' Roses fan. <laughs> so but but those aren't the kind of people that would then be bullies either, which is really fun. It's like it, it's not the guy in like the Letterman jacket. No. It's these two it's these two like like rock alternative types bullying the cool california guy yeah actually the guy the pearl jam guy looks like he later got into um wearing having frosted tips he became a new metal guy definitely absolutely this is a few years away from being big into corn yeah yeah if if um, this had been definitely. released six or seven years later those guys would have been in the graveyard going boom, nan, nan, boom, nan, 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 and he'd, he'd just like ride his bike up and then they would steal his shoes people yep. equals which um as it were as a very niche uh slipknot joke for any of our beloved <laughs> listeners uh who definitely are probably not slipknot fans but never mind um okay so so running through the plot then so um to begin with we've got a flashback to salem 
famous for its witches, but but weren't actually witches. But in this in this universe, they were witches. Um, and these three witches, they steal a kid's life essence. They turn her brother into a cat, and then they get hanged. But before they get hanged, they put a curse on, so that if a virgin lights the black flame candle in their cottage on a full moon on Halloween, then they'll come back. All very normal. Absolutely normal behaviour. All very all very kind of niche conditions that need to happen. Yep. So we've got Winnie, Sarah, and Mary, these three witches. Amazingly played, by the way. I love all of their characters. Yep. Um, Great performances. And that's what makes it, I think, from all, oh, all yeah. of the cast is good. I don't think anyone lets the side down. But yeah, that's the, the main focus of it is just them doing witch stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's really it's really great. You've got Bette Midler as Winnie, Sarah Jessica Parker as Sarah, and Kathy Najimi as uh, Mary, and they're all really great as these three different um, three different witches. Really, really good. Um, but yeah, so then we flash forward to the nineties, the radical nineties, the Pearl Jam nineties, rad to the max, and Max, our rad to the max, Max. Takes his younger sister, Thora Birch. Yeah. Young Thora Birch. Amazing. Star of the Dungeons um, and Dragons movie. <laughs> star, star of the Dungeons and Dragons movie. That is the highlight of her career. Um no, she's she's good actually. Obviously in yeah. Ghost World, I'm sure you're a you're a fan. Yeah, of. yeah. Um very, very also, good adaptation of the comic book. Which I've not seen nor read, but I've heard very oh. good things about. I'd say you should read um, it first. Yeah, yeah. I, I I keep meaning to to read it. it. It's meant to be meant to be great. But also, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons the movie, The Hole, which is like a a, a teenage psychological thriller, um, and all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff, and American um, Beauty and, as well, and American Beauty, of course. Um, but um, one thing that you should watch with her in is Monkey Trouble. Monkey Trouble. Did you ever see Monkey Monkey Trouble? Oh, yes. It is a monkey film. The monkey has a baseball cap. I've seen clips from this, but I've never seen it. (laughs) Have you not? It is is the most Paddy Johnston movie I think I've ever seen, even though it doesn't have a dog, but it's a monkey. Isn't it sort of a slightly more aggressive version of Dunstan Checks In, which I think is is up my street. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say no to that. You would. You would love Monkey Trouble. We used to have it on video, and I can remember very little about it. But I do remember that it has a monkey with a baseball cap and hijinks in shoe. Although this predated Dunstan Checks In by two years. <laughs> Dunstan Checks In was the sellout version. Yeah. Dunstan sells out. This was the real radical <laughs> monkey movie. It's amazing of the 90s. how many monkey films there were in the 90s. <laughs> so good. Um, but anyway, yes. Uh, uh, Max, our radical fella, he takes his his sister Danny out trick or treating, and um, they end up accidentally um, resurrecting the witches when he lights the black flame candle because he thinks it's all a joke. And he, yeah, he's he's got that cynicism of the nineties. He don't care. He's an he's a nineties teenager dude who plays the drums. Who just moved to Salem from LA? So that's yes. the big joke. Yeah. He just moved there from LA. To a massive house with a bedroom that has a mezzanine in it. And he's all like, I can't believe you made me move here. To I can't this believe awesome you made house. me move here to this beautiful part of the world, into this awesome house where I have so much space for my drum kit, man. Yeah, it makes Salem look quite nice, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Salem, Salem is meant to be nice, isn't it? As a place. Yeah. We, um, I've, I've not been there. We've been to the Plymouth Plantation, which is kind of, which is very, very close to there and is where the settlers, the first settlers were. Mm, mm. Yeah, I think I think Salem's meant to be nice. I mean, Massachusetts in general is a very yeah. Nice I think I think maybe we drove through it, but it's yeah, it's nice. It's very very beautiful. Yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So he's furious that he's in this lovely part of the world, um, and uh, yeah, accidentally brings back these witches, and then all sorts of hijinks happen. So um, you know, they 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 meet up with the talking cat who's been living since the 1600s. No, I love me a talking to, cat. Yeah, Talking Cat, always good. You're a fan of Binks in this movie? Yes, absolutely. Very, very good Talking Cat performance. I mean, he's not quite Salem from Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but he's up there. You know, He's up there. He's a good Talking Cat. Um, you meet um, Headless Zombie. Um, what's he called? 
um, Billy Billy Bu- Billy Butcherson, played by Doug Jones, the iconic Doug Jones, who, along yeah. with the other with the main three witches, is the only one who's in the second film as well. Yes, it's a shame that they didn't have any cameos from the 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 other characters from the um, cat that played Binks. <laughs> yeah, I mean Binks the cat is dead. Yeah. Spoiler alert for Hocus Pocus. <laughs> At the end, he the curse is lifted and he becomes a ghost and meets up with his the dead sort of sister. Quite okay looking for 1993, but now looks a bit fake. Sort of, is it animatronic? Is it not talking cat? <laughs> quite yeah, it's that. like a. I think it's more CG, isn't it? Yeah, like a mixture of animatronic and CG they've done, which does look very strange. Um, yeah, I, I did think. Sorry for jumping forward. I did think it's a bit of a shame that they didn't get back. Um, you know, uh, Max or Danny or um, Allison as the other character who's the love yeah. interest. Max is a dad now, surely. It would have been. It would have been his kids. Would have been the logical move. Yeah, I think. Well, I. I don't. Even if it was just them turning up at some point or being seen somewhere and going, "Oh no, not again!" and an eye roll, just a little cameo. Um, apparently, Katz, uh, Omri Katz, who played Max, he now Omri operates a cats. cannabis company. Oh, really? That's what he does. Good for him. Yes. Um, stopped acting in two thousand and two. Apparently. But yeah, they could have got him back in as a as a as a cameo. Um, another another thing to bear in mind is that Thora Birch is obviously still acting, um, yeah. as is Vanessa Shaw, who plays Allison, who's the other of the main trio of characters trying to stop the Sanderson. She's she's the other one, um, and she's she's still in in good stuff. She's in um, a really good sort of um, thriller called Clinical, which is a sort of horror movie thrillery thing. Um, where she's a, a psychiatrist and nasty stuff goes down, and it's all very silly but very well done. It's like eh, she's still she's still good. She could she could be in stuff. Thora yeah. Birch is still good. They could be in stuff. Absolutely. Maybe they were busy. Yeah, I just think it's a shame that they didn't. There, there's so many callbacks in Hocus Pocus too that it almost feels like those kind of nods to the audience would be fine to have. Um, because it is a it is a movie basically made up entirely of callbacks to, to yeah. the original, um, but um, but yes, yeah, so I think it is a bit of a shame they're not on it. But but they're really good in this. I think you know sometimes you it's a bit of a coin flip with young casts as to how well they'll hold up. But I think here they do a really good job. Yeah, absolutely. And D- Doug Jones is an icon, and he I think he's probably best known to us as the Fishman from The Shape of Water. But he's like. Not only an amazing actor, but he's like he's known as a contortionist as well, and like he can he or he often plays sort of weird subhuman creatures or those kinds of things, and he does it really really well and brilliantly. So it's like if you've got that kind of role, he's the guy who's going to get it. Yeah, I mean, just a few examples of characters he's played over the years. He's Abe Sapien in the Hellboy movies. Uh, the pale man in Pan's Labyrinth, i.e., the horrifyingly yeah. scary bit of Pan's Labyrinth. Jeez. Um, he's, uh, he plays, uh, the, the creepy, um, the, the creepy main villain in Quarantine, which is the remake of Wreck. Oh, you, right. you, I've we've watched, seen it. Have we not watched Wreck together? Not together. I've seen, I've seen it, but I've not seen any of the remakes or anything. Uh, the remake's rubbish, but of course, Doug James is, is good. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> this is uh, here. Batman Returns, Thin Clown. Is that a Batman villain Perfect. I don't know about, or is Perfect. that just a... the, the Thin Clown? I assume one of <laughs> one of the one of the Batman Returns is the the Penguin one, isn't it? And the Penguin has lots of clown. Um, the Thin people. White Clown wasn't that one of David Bowie's aliases? <laughs> <laughs> but he works with Guillermo del Toro an awful lot. He's in Crimson Peak as well. Crimson um, Peak. Crimson that was a good Peak. film. Which is a, yeah, I love that movie. That's that's going to be something I watch over the weekend. Um, and yeah, it, all sorts over the years. You need someone to be thin and creepy, then he's there for you. But also a really good actor in general in other stuff as well. Yeah, absolute legend. Um, and it, was, it was a pleasure to see him in this and he was delightful. Yeah, he was very funny. He, and he's great. He's great. Really funny character as a sort of zombie, but uh, a sympathetic zombie, not a eat your brain zombie. No, not even. Is he even really a zombie? He's just, yeah, just just a guy who happens to be undead. Yeah, a guy who happens to be undead. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, so hijinks ensue, 
Um, and eventually they manage to get the Sanderson sisters back into not being alive anymore by them not having stolen anyone's souls by the time that the sun comes up. Yeah, which is, I think, is that only revealed like halfway through the film? They're like, oh, suddenly it's like, oh, we're actually on a time limit. We can just, we can just hold them off until morning and it'll be fine. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's, <laughs> I don't think it's initially <laughs> revealed that that's what's going on, is it? I think it does kind of come up halfway through. Um, but you're like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in on it. This is like the trolls in Lord of the Rings. We'll just, we'll just roll with it. Um, yeah, but it, it's great. It, it's a great little fun family romp. Um, with, uh, with, yeah, lots of silly moments. It makes a lot of fun out of, um, the witches not understanding the modern world and going, uh, misunderstanding people wearing costumes as being the real thing and mistaking someone dressed up as Satan for the real Satan and everything like that. And there's lots of fun things like yeah. that. Yeah, a guy dressed up as Satan who is Gary Marshall. Did you did you know? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, which is great. Apparently, an uncredited performance in this movie. And then um, Penny Marshall, who is his wife, who is the director of A League of Their Own, which is one of my favourite films. Ah, there we go. There we go. Um, who also did Big, didn't she? Yes, that's she right. She did Big too, which is a great film. Um, but yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a fun little scene and they get scared off by a dog wearing a little devil costume. Which is very um, funny. Which is which is extremely good. Um, but yeah, it's it's and, and I think those kind of moments are probably the most entertaining bits of the film is the, the witches interacting with the modern world. Yeah, and they, they go for that a bit harder in the second one, don't they? Yeah, the more kind of yeah. like hi- joke historical jokes. Oh, they wouldn't have had they wouldn't have had Roombas in Salem in sixteen fifty three. That kind of humor, but in the first one, there's just enough of it to make it funny, isn't there? Like uh, after they come out of that scene, some children have stolen their brooms as well, and they're all a bit confused by it. And kind of the the dynamic between the witches is quite funny as well, with Bette Midler being the the kind of the matriarchal figure, and the other two being sort of bungling and inept is very funny as well. Yeah, they get the dynamic down really well, and I think that's. That's very well done. Um, so yeah, it's it's an enjoyable movie, I'd say, and it's it holds up really well. Um, I don't think there's anything about it that um, that that has aged too poorly. I think you mentioned the special effects being a bit dated now, but you can easily forgive that. Oh yeah, of course. When it's a, when it's a movie like this, um, when it's a cat, it's it's allowed. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> when it's an animal, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, those kind of things are dated, but actually the main story is still really good. And all um, the kind of the magical stuff, there's actually not loads of CGI stuff, is there? Most no, of it is actually no. costume and stuff done in a very effective way. Yeah, exactly. And I think that works in its favour as they didn't try and overdo it on those kind of effects. And actually, that means that it's aged rather well. And also, it doesn't get overblown with magic nonsense either. It's very much physically driven or character driven yeah. there's lots of like witches brooms chasing them so it, it never gets bogged down in two people holding out wands and firing them at one another like in the harry potter movies no it's it's all quite real isn't it sort of. yeah. and the amount of yeah. kind of actual nefarious magic done is actually very very minimal isn't it yeah and, and obviously that that really works in the film's favor in terms of its plot and pacing as well because if you make these witches too powerful in terms of what magic they can do it kind of removes all the agency from the story because they could just magic themselves there yeah um but instead it does have that element of um these powerful witches but then they're not all powerful which means that then it comes down to the 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 modern day humans outsmarting them or knowing the world better which does add to that interesting kind of friction between the two yeah and although it's never super clear what the witches really want. I mean, obviously they want children so that they can be young, but it doesn't really push that much. It's more just like they've come back and we're just going to show you them kind of romping around the town for a bit. And that's what you want. Yeah, the idea is that they they, they need to eat a child's essence to to be able to stay there permanently and then to to maintain their um to maintain their youth. Um but then a lot of it is just them running around doing witchy stuff yeah um, like trapping the bullies they? in cages which is very very yes, funny and then they're, they're like crying good. well they're gonna they're gonna put them they're going through the the um the spell book trying to find what the ingredients are and they're going dead man's bums that was funny that made me laugh 
<laughs> yeah, it really leans into silly witch stuff, doesn't it? Lots yeah. of tropes around witches, which I think, again, works in its favour. And Max doesn't rescue them, which is funny. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're stuck in the cages at the end, um, which is which is great. Um, so yeah, is there anything else you want to say about, about Hocus Pocus? Um, no, I, I think we've pretty much covered it, haven't we? So yeah, we can we can talk about the second one now. Yes, yeah. And we can always jump jump back, can't we? Yes, we exactly. can we can time travel. We're allowed we can, to time we're, travel. We're we we're, we're wizards in our own way, or warlocks, maybe. It depends on how nice you're feeling. Yeah. Um, or if we go by bewitched, Michael Caine was just referred to as a witch in that film, wasn't he? So yeah, I I'm going to say that a man can be a witch. Why not? I'm going to be a warlock because I'm a nasty boy. Warlock always know. makes me think of someone quite sort of haggard and a bit, um, oh, what's what's the word? A bit wizened, you know? Yeah, that's me. I don't me. know why. <laughs> I was <laughs> trying to be kind, but yeah, that is you. That's me. I'm a, that's you, that is. I mean, warlock comes from, comes from um, I think, sort of Scottish. So I, I'll go with that. Warlock roaster. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna be a warlock, and you can be a witch. There we go. Cool. Sounds good. I'm, 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 happy I'm, with a, that. I'm a haggard old man. Going. <laughs> that's me. I mean, that's just who I am. Yeah. Because the life. witch, the witch, the witches are back. As soon as they appear, they immediately burst into song, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm done with this. It's one of my See, favorite Elton John songs. Put a spin on it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> See, I was. Not as down for the constant singing in this movie. I enjoyed. You, you hate warmth and mirth. Is the problem with you? <laughs> I do. I hate warmth and mirth. I was um, worried no. it might actually turn into a musical, and then we'd have a real problem on our hands. Yeah, I mean, I was a bit worried when they really immediately burst into song. I was like, oh gosh, no, is this going to be like a? Are they really going to lean into the music side? And they sort of did, which I didn't like because. Because in the first one, how do you feel about them doing uh, I Put a Spell on You in the first one? It's the way great. they do it, they kind of really put their own spin on it, don't they? Yeah, it's great. And it's just a one-off thing that was really well done. And I really enjoyed it. But when they, they do three songs, I think, in this one, don't they? Or maybe they do two and then they redo the They the do one way back. or another to as in place of I Put a Spell on You to put yeah. a curse on the town again to do the same thing as the first film. Which is fine, but it's <laughs> yeah, not as to do good, exactly the same thing again. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, the the fact that there's more, it comes up more than once. I think kind of cheapens it a little bit. Whereas if they just had the one, it would have been stronger. Is is my personal opinion on the matter. Yeah, I I, I can't disagree with that. But I also liked the, them singing that song because it was funny, and I liked Which, yes. the the kind of the talent show setup thing. I thought was quite funny, and that was always going to be the inevitable payoff, wasn't it? Yeah, and and I I did appreciate the, the the talent show element. It's just that it's it's like how in Jaws, um, they would only get that, but you can only do one really big horrifying jump scare. And so they found that when they did it with different audiences, um, it would either be the head of the of the swimmer when that pops up, um, and then when that was removed from test footage, it would be when Jaws itself pops up near the end. All right. But you can only get one big scary move, scary moment like that in a movie. One big jump scare like that that gets everybody. Um, and this is the same with songs in a movie that isn't a musical, where you can get away with doing one and it has a lot of power. If you do it more than once, and it kind of lessens it. So I felt like, I felt like the second song this time was lessened because we'd already had the first song. Yeah, that was the problem with Marriage Story, wasn't it? Because um, there's there was that bit if you remember sort of towards the end where he gets up and sings a song from a musical in a bar in New York. Yeah, but he's already had like he's already sung the Mar- the Randy Newman song halfway through the film. <laughs> he's so, already yeah. gone. Marriage is falling apart. <laughs> I'm gonna have to put that song in this episode again, I, like I did last week, aren't I? Yeah, you're gonna have to. I'm sorry. Our marriage is falling apart. Our marriage is falling apart. I hate you, and you hate me, so let's go and get a divorce. Maybe I should just use that as the theme music. Stop trying <laughs> to promote my lo-fi hip-hop music and just put that back in. Just put that, just put that in. Just put, or, or make a lo-fi hip-hop version of it. That's your challenge. Okay. Is take my... Because lo-fi hip-hop often has vocal... 
um, samples. Yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. So, so yeah, do a, do a lo-fi hip-hop version of Our Marriage is Falling Apart. And I okay. expect this to be, like, live on Spotify and everything like that, and for me to have a co-writer credit on it, by the way. Okay. I'm, I, I don't well, want any money out of it. Royalties. I just want... I don't want any money out of it. I just want the 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 the, the co credit for for writing or performance. Hey, it's not to be sniffed at. I just got an eight eight dollar royalty statement from Spotify today. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm still waiting on mine. <laughs> I've, I've mine's on like mine's on like one dollar at the moment, and I'm just like for God's sake. And I need I think it's like a five dollar threshold before I can pay out. All right, yeah. So I'm stuck there waiting for the rest of it to come through. It's really irritating. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> anyway yeah um uh but yeah no please do i I demand that's that's my that's my wish for you is to make a lo-fi hip-hop version and then that can be our our theme tune yeah i think that that, would work how does that sound yeah yeah um (laughs) excellent um but yeah okay so hocus pocus 2 um came out this year came out this year came out very recently in fact it was it was the beginning of the the beginning of October, end of September, something like that. In time for um, Halloween. Yeah, Halloween season is when this movie came out. And it is basically like a a, a, re, a repeat of, of the original Hocus Pocus. This is Jurassic World to Jurassic Park. I've never seen original. Jurassic World. It's not really worth it. They're not very good. Has it got Chris Pratt going, oh, a T-Rex? Well, that just happened. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. Um, you've got him undermining, basically negging Bryce Dallas Howard's character all the way through, right. uh, which is very irritating as well. Um, it's it. They're not. They're not very good. The Jurassic World movies. Speaking personally, they I don't need to like exist. Them. Is the problem? No, ju- I Jurassic mean, ju- Park is there. Just watch Jurassic Park if you're on Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh yeah, or, Jurassic- or even the Lost World and Jurassic Park Three. Sam Neill is not in the Lost World, is that right? That's right. It's Jeff and then he comes back. That's right. He comes back for Jurassic Park three. None of those are bad. Like Jurassic Park is amazing. Two and three are okay. I think they steadily get worse. I'd say it goes Jurassic Park, then Lost World, then and I can take or leave Jurassic Park three. If I'm watching Jurassic Park movies, I'll often leave that one out. But the first two, perfectly watchable, perfectly serviceable. I mean, Jurassic Park, the original, is is perfect. Perfect movie. There's nothing you, you'd want to change about that film at all. No. And, and yeah, so Hocus Pocus 2, it's very much a sort of... It's, it's a sequel, but at the same time, it's a remake because it basically does the same story threads with a few differences here and there. Um, one but with thing, a good cast, I'm going to say. With a really good cast. Um, everyone in this movie is really good. Obviously, you get the three witch sisters back and you get Doug Jones back and they're all perfect. So there's been no, there's no loss of love for these characters from any of them. You can really tell that, that they've all fully embraced being these characters again, which is great to see. Um, but then the the new characters as well are really good. Um, like Sam Richardson. Yeah, our main Hell man. Was within. <laughs> He's been in two out of our four. <laughs> two Halloween out of our four episodes. Halloween episodes, um, which is per- which is great. The, which who man will be of the, the year? The warlock of the <laughs> year. He's, yeah, he's their biggest fan, who now runs the shop, and he's got the cursed book. Yeah, and he's the one who who tricks the kids this time into into lighting the black flame candle to bring them back. Um, so he's kind of a villain, but at the same time sympathetic because all he wanted he didn't realize they were going to be as evil as they are. Um, yeah, he just likes the the witch aesthetic, which you yeah. know is understandable. And he's incredibly funny again because he's an incredibly funny guy, and and is great in this. But also, everyone else is good. Tony Hale as Tony the Hale is always a delight, and I love and, him. And he played the, the guy in the flashback. And the first the first time, the like, few minutes, I was like, "Hang on, is that Tony Hale?" He's got <laughs> yeah. like that kind of wearing the pilgrim hat and the long hair. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it's really good. It's so well done. Um, and he's he's brilliant in this movie as both the as you said in the prequel element, but then also in uh, in in the in the modern day aspects where he's the mayor of the town or he's running for mayor. I can't remember which. I think he um, is the mayor, but there's an election coming an election up because they're up. canvassing. Yeah, um, but he's it's got this kind of all, it's almost a subplot of him trying to get his nice toffee apple and he never gets it. <laughs> I know, which is such a tragedy. <laughs> the film spends um, a lot of time on it. <laughs> It does spend a lot of time on it, and for good reason, because he's really funny doing it. Um, but also shout outs to our sort of uh, our main three young people this time, where you've mm. got Becca, Izzy, and Cassie. 
uh, Whitney Peak, uh, Belissa Escobedo, and Lilia Buckingham, who are all really, really good as well. Yeah, who all, um, I'm sure have bright futures ahead of them. Yeah, they're all they're all great in this. Really, really talented. And also, I wanted to shout out quickly. I hate the prequel bit at the beginning. The yes, I hated bit. that too. It went on forever. I um, <laughs> was really dour and silly. It's completely unnecessary. Just jump in with the goofy teenage stuff because that's what it's really about. But I want to say, young Winifred, young Sarah, young Mary, really great performances from those three kids in terms of yes. emulating the older witches. They do a really good job. So those three kids playing them, great job, really good. Although actually, I did appreciate Hannah Waddingham as the kind of the mother witch figure. Yes, yeah, I was disappointed. I was disappointed that she didn't come up again, actually. Yeah. I was expecting her to come up again later on in the movie, but she doesn't. That's probably like a day's work. Yeah. I, like, I would have liked her to come up at the end and be like, I told you not to do that spell. Hold up. Uh, her filmography says 2024 Garfield role and voice. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know there was a 2024 Garfield. Uh, you know who's voicing Garfield? Oh, my. I've just looked at it. <laughs> I wish I hadn't. It's our boy Mario. <laughs> Hi. Do you Hi. like Mondays? I like lasagna. <laughs> Hang on. Samuel L. Jackson as Vic, Garfield's father. No. I'm sorry. No, that's not happening. Garfield doesn't Garfield's have a father. father. Garfield is his own father. <laughs> that's how comic strips work. Um, Everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah, no. Ah. Oh. I've just eaten a lasagna. That was delicious. I can't wait for, for Chris Pratt to go and do some PR work for it and be like, I've always loved the comic Garfield and then holds up a poster of, um, what's the other orange cat character? <laughs> Not Garfield, the other one. Crazy cat. What's he, what's he called? Do you know cat. this? You're our, you're our, um, you're our resident comic. The resident. Fabulous Fairy Freak Brothers cat. That guy. <laughs> no, the other one. Um, Top Cat. Oh my God, what's he called? Um, I've got no idea who you're talking about. There's, there's literally another orange Heathcliff. Heathcliff. Oh yeah, yeah. Heathcliff yeah. Cat. Yeah. I can't wait for. I won't. Can't wait for 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 the Heathcliff movie starring Chris Pratt. That's right. Heathcliff. 1984 TV series. That's right. Nothing to do with Kate Bush. Which does Heath? Does Heathcliff predate Garfield? Um, Heathcliff was nineteen seventy three. Oh, does it? That's a that's a good question. Garfield was nineteen seventy eight. Oh wow! Originally published in nineteen seventy six as John, which there's a very very good uh, YouTube documentary about the 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 creation of Garfield and looking at all of these original. Uh, John scripts and John comics, which were a local one from Jim Davis ah. before it then became a focus on Garfield instead. Um, but yeah, so Heathcliff predates Garfield. Garfield is the Oreo cookie to the Hydrox cookie that is Heathcliff. Wow. Which you, you know about Oreos and, and Hydrox, don't you? No. So Oreo is not the original Oreo style cookie. So Oreos um were uh there was a previous one it's an imitation of a cookie called the hydrox cookie but that sounds like a medicine you'd put up your bum (laughs) exactly and i imagine that's probably why hydrox was less successful (laughs) um but so hydrox cookies which are but it's exactly the same thing it's two like chocolate cookies with a with a creamy center um Hydrox was introduced in 1908. Oreo was introduced in 1912. Oh, yeah. I'm looking at it now. It's got, like, but, medieval-looking branding. Yeah. It's, this is bizarre. <laughs> it's it's fascinating. Um, and, and eventually Oreo took over from Hydrox in terms of which the most popular um, cookie chain was. Yeah. Um, but Hydrox still it kept going for until the 90s and then, um, and then eventually was reintroduced. So, um, looking at you know, this now, still they there. appear to be on sale. You can on buy sale them. where they're on Amazon, you can buy them online. 
Oh my days! I might have to get some Hydrox cookies. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think probably the fact that they're called Hydrox probably puts quite a lot of people off. <laughs> yeah, it looks weird. <laughs> this is Oreo. Um, How did we get onto Hydrox cookies? Oh, we were talking about Heathcliff because we we realised that um, that Chris Pratt is going to be doing yet more voice work in spite of the fact that he's a terrible voice actor. He's the voice of everything. Um, <laughs> he's going to go, but yeah, you the, won't the, believe the, I've done something really different with Garfield's voice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Garfield. <laughs> Whereas once again, Garfield should be played by Matt Berry. Yeah. <laughs> have you have you seen the video of someone doing Garfield as Matt Berry? No. I'll, I'll try and find that's it for you and send it on. It's notes. really, it's really good. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, we were talking about the, the the sort of flashback scene, and I really hate that flashback scene because it does it does bring up something that is kind of irritating about this movie. And one of the reasons why I didn't like it as much as the original is there seems to be this real focus at the moment with giving a tragic backstory and humanization to villain characters in everything. Yeah, and that's what they did here, where. Which is, you know, widely accepted as a storytelling cardinal sin, isn't it? You know, these days it's sort of the, oh, but he loves his mother or he's nice to cats kind of thing. It's it's just that, isn't it? That kind of basic don't do that thing that you're taught in writing in They did it in the Jeffrey Dahmer TV series that's just come out, which no one should watch because the families of the people who were murdered by Jeffrey Dahmer were not consulted on its creation. So don't watch that that horrible nonsense um it's completely disrespectful for for the people involved um but apparently that humanizes this this serial killer <laughs> because lots of places are really desperate to humanize their villains to add that complexity and that sympathy to them whereas like the sanderson sisters are literally evil witches that eat children we didn't need to have a tragic backstory about how one of them was going to get married off so they ran into the woods we didn't no. need that scene at the end where um they uh where they realize that they love each other as sisters and now they can be together and they're all happy and they love each other because it kind of undermines the characters where one of them is the is the main witch and she has contempt for her two sisters but tolerates them as as lackeys (laughs) you know it kind of messes around with the dynamic it was kind of the obvious way to tie it up and do the spell to get them to pass on to the next world or whatever, you know. So they yeah, kind of yeah. they wrote themselves into a corner on that, and it was an easy out. But yeah, it felt incongruous with the, with it, especially it, with the bungling yeah. nature of the other two, which was more apparent in this film and was more funny. Yeah, it's it's really jarring that they tried to do this earnest element to the film. You know, we didn't need Hocus Pocus 2 to be about the societal pressure people feel within Puritan townships in the 1600s. Exactly, guys. This, this is Hocus Pocus 2 on Disney+. Plus. It's it's not like the new 10-part it's drama not, series that yeah, Amazon this, is this advertising is not, this on is the not tape the of the witch. boxes. Yeah. Or- or you know this is this is not the crucible yeah. we, we can we can <laughs> accept this as being something silly about witches um you could still I mean, have had that as the ending and that would have actually been fine if you if you just cut out the prologue completely and then just yeah, wove in a yeah. few little moments of sisterly love throughout the film and then it would have felt, would have been fine but instead what you get is you get this bit at the beginning which is really um jarring to the rest of the film because it is this very very you know, sympathetic scene. Then apart you get from Tony Hale thrill. being in both, obviously. Apart from, apart from that. Um, and then you get absolutely nothing throughout the rest of the movie and then you get the saccharine ending. And it's just like, mm, yeah, that's very, very... You get a bit of whiplash from it, don't you? Because they yeah. didn't embed it throughout the rest of the movie very well. Um, and it's all kind of summed up by the gross eyeball book having a tear running down yeah. its skin cheek. <laughs> Skin cheek. Um, as as that sounds like as a new the, metal band. Skin cheek is definitely a new metal <laughs> band. Um, yeah, yeah. The weird, the weird patchy skin cheeks that it's got. You see this tear running down, and you're like, "Why? T- this should not exist. This is a gross, evil book." And they try to what? give the book some agency at one point, but then kind of row back on it as well. That didn't really work either. Yeah, they they were very desperate to to add sympathy to the villains in this movie, and I think. I think movies need to recognise you can let villains be villains, and that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I, I don't need to see a prequel of Aladdin where we find out that Jafar had a mean dad, <laughs> you know? oh, no. or, or that Jafar was bullied at school. His his original parrot was lost in a fire. 
A genie I killed his I parrot. I don't, I don't need to watch uh, a, a Little Mermaid prequel where we find out that Ursula had depression. I mean, yeah. like this kind of stuff, I don't I don't need. I, I want to celebrate villains for villainy's sake, and I think more movies need to get to that. But the thing about uh, that is you, you can make villains... What you what you hear talked about a lot in like fantasy writing theory is is characters being morally grey, which is something else, isn't it? But it's like humanizing a villain is one thing. You don't need to do that to make them engaging or to make people even care about them or to make a good story. They just need to have motivation, right? You just need to understand yeah, exactly. what they want and that it's bad and that you don't want them to get it. And that to tell a story. And if you want to make things a bit more complex, then fine. But yeah, to, but don't just have some kind of boring, tragic backstory to an already established villain in culture is the difficulty, I think, really. That's what yeah. you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I do find I do find the idea of constantly trying to make villains be morally grey very tiring in its own right. Yeah. Um if they try and do that to Dracula, I'm I'm gonna have to write to somebody. And and like they sort of did do that to Dracula in in the the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula a little bit, but it worked. In the but it was also hilarious. Gary Oldman with his heart shaped hair, so you couldn't take <laughs> yeah. it seriously. Yeah, it, it worked in the framing of the movie. Um, whereas, As you said like, in the last certain... episode, Dracula is a horn dog. <laughs> Dracula is a horn dog. So that's enough um, characterization, isn't it? Yeah. Where, whereas, like, you look at some villains, and you don't need that complexity. You don't look at Alien, and and try and decide whether the xenomorph needs a backstory um which is one of the problems with the with the alien prequels is they try and give this contextual thing to why the alien exists and it's like you don't need that you don't watch the terminator and want to find out whether the evil terminator in each movie actually has a change of heart or not or is just doing it because of capitalism and it's 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 it, you don't want them to turn to the camera like one of the animals from the Flintstones and go, "It's a living." Do you? You want them to be a horrifying killing machine. The Sanderson sisters, you want them to be witches that revel in their rich witchery and eat children because they enjoy it. Yeah, you don't you don't need them to have this context behind why they do these things and do witch stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, no, that did that did frustrate me. It didn't take away from the quality of the movie overall. No, but it made it made it feel a bit flat, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, like they referenced getting the book with a pact from the devil in the first film, and then in the second film, it was just like whatever. The book's crying now. You made the book cry. And they also didn't get the book in a pact with the devil because they just got handed it by another witch. That's like, oh, you you're a sweet little coven of witches, and look after yourselves because yeah. family. Exactly. Yeah. It's like yeah, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers for that. I, I, I just want them to be villains. Give me proper villains. That's all I want from a movie. Yeah. Give me straightforward, simple villains. Which is why we have Dracula. The <laughs> perfect villain. Perfect villain. Who is who is your perfect villain? Oh, I don't know. What well, is you mean Dracula? Aside from Dra- Gary Oldman as Dracula. <laughs> aside from Gary Oldman as <laughs> Dracula. Oh, I don't know. I'll have to come back to you on that. Yeah, have a think about it. I think I think the various Terminators are very good. Gaston as, as villains. Gaston. He's a, a villain, villain that I like, though. That's a different yeah. thing. And the thing is that Disney has a lot of those really good villains who are total bastards, but you kind of worry that they are going to go back because they've done like Cruella de Vil, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, that that that's the most hilarious example where. No, not only was she killed, the Dalmatians pushed her off a cliff. Yeah, the Dalmatians murdered her, <laughs> which is amazing. I didn't hate um, it, though. Well, to maybe we can talk I've about not, that another not, time. It was I've actually kind it, of hilarious. I have no intention of watching it, so <laughs> please don't. Well, I'm going to send some Dalmatians to push you off a cliff then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like Ursula and the Little Mermaid, where you get these hints of this backstory there between, like, a friction between her and King Triton. But you don't need to know more than that, other than that there is this this friction where she wants to take control of the kingdom. A, a film dedicated to the villain as a whole separate thing, I don't mind as a concept. No, but it's very no, difficult they can to do, do well, it really isn't well. It? You, it can work really well. I mean, I know you're probably not going to watch it ever, but Joker from 2019 is a good movie i i, know that I, I do want to watch it. it at some point i i know that lots of people don't like it and they think it's oh it's it's a movie that celebrates insults and it's no it's not it's an anti-capitalist movie about how we should treat people with dignity <laughs> and if they don't they might destroy us all yeah it's 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 a it's a really good film um 
it's and, and and it's worth watching you can do those movies that focus on the villains and do it in a really good way um you know what what is the godfather yeah. <laughs> if not a movie that focus or scarface you know you can do movies about bad people and 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 evil people and have it be engaging and have that complexity there but you don't always need to have that complexity there i think is the thing that people no. need to need to take away from it hocus pocus 2 does not need to be complex it needs to be goofy no. and witchy and and the best thing the best parts of this movie similar to the previous one are those are those silly bits where it's the witch is going ah oh, there's a force field here and it's a it's a sliding door at a shop or, yeah. or looking at or, or seeing a camera filter and thinking that they had been de-aged by putting serum on their faces yeah and they she takes them to the walgreens and think they think it's an apothecary where they can get stuff yeah. to make them young and they're like drinking the moisturizer that was funny it's so good like that's a really great scene um I loved the bits where the Sanderson sisters are being like they're being celebrated at Halloween and you've got all the kids wearing the costumes and they have that bit on stage where it's the lookalikes contest. Uh, All of that stuff was so good. Yeah. Like that's clearly the best bit here is that reintroduction of the Sanderson sisters are back in the modern world and they don't understand it and chaos ensues. That's such a it's such a great hook for these movies. Yeah, and the the nostalgia hook I think actually did work quite well. It yeah, did go yeah, here's a I thing agree. that you loved, and here's a, a way to bring it to you and serve it up to you again as content. That actually did work. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Oftentimes, with those kind of things, I'm a, I'm I I'm skeptical, and it doesn't often work for me. But um, but this one certainly does. I think this is a movie that embraces and i think it's because it's clearly been done with a lot of heart rather than with a lot of cynicism behind it i think it's probably the the the, the reason why it works so well oh yeah it feels it doesn't feel cynical and that's why it's it it's good isn't it it would feel if it felt cynical and was like a just a bad story clearly cashing in then all of the problems that we've mentioned with it would feel like much bigger problems but as it is they just sort of wash over you yeah, they it it's a movie that understands why the first one was so good and so celebrated, and it uses that to really make uh, make a good sequel that that fans of the original can really get on board with because this is this is a movie made for fans of a cult film that clearly want more of that, and this is a movie that delivers that. So I think it comes from that position of knowing what the fans want and wanting to give it to them. Yeah, it it feels less like just like a sausage in the content machine, doesn't it? That's mixing yeah. metaphors, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yes. The sausage machine. Yeah, that the, is Disney Plus. The meat grinder of Disney Plus. This is yeah. this is a better slurry that comes out of the other end than some of the slurry. This is a prime yeah. slurry. Prime slurry. It's, it's made into decent burgers rather than dog food. The slurry of of this movie. Yeah, I'm sure that when Monkey Trouble 2 comes around, that will be just as good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. But yeah, no, this is a movie that's been made with care for the world that it's in. And I think that does show through. And like, yeah, it's not as good as the original. But if you like the original, you're probably going to like this as well. Yeah, absolutely. If if you like the original, I think this is going to be right up your street. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you don't, exactly. then it's probably not for you. But if you're up, if you're just looking for some kind of goofy Halloween fun for the family, then you could do a lot worse. Yeah, no, exactly. I think you know you could certainly do worse. Um, what you could do worse than 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 watching this, and I, you don't necessarily need to have watched the original to enjoy this either. I'd say there's a lot of callbacks, but I think they're callbacks that work without you necessarily having to have seen the original to really get what's going on. No. Oh yeah, you you could go into it cold, and obviously you wouldn't. The the opening flashback that goes on forever isn't the best introduction, but no. But once the witchy goof gets going, then it's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, anything else you want to say about about Hocus Pocus Two? Uh, no, th- I think we've covered it. It's it's good. Tony Hale is a delight. Sam Richardson is a delight. Everyone, all the cast is good. It's mm. it's pretty slick, you know. There is there's a black cat, but it doesn't talk, which is kind of a letdown. But yeah, where, that, yeah, where's our talking cat, you bastards? 
<laughs> so yeah, um, it's good. It's a nice way to round off for uh, Halloween month, actually. Yeah, something fun this time rather than something horrifying. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to highlight is the director is Anne Fletcher, who also did Dumpling. Ah, right. Which is a movie we both really enjoyed. Which um, also starred Kathy Najimy. Yes, yeah. Which is, yeah, a, a, a nice little film, Dumpling. It was a very, very so, good film, yeah. Um, so yeah, intrigued to see intrigued to see what comes up. She's done she's done a few bits and bobs over the years. One movie that we need to watch, which we haven't watched yet, Twenty Seven Dresses. Ah uh, yes, I think I've seen half of it once. <laughs> there we go. I, I think I have seen Step Up, which was her other one. Yeah, Step which Up is one of those the... dance one of those street dance that's, films. That's the dance one with um, our dog boy Channing Tatum. <laughs> yeah, Save the Last Dog. <laughs> the Last Dog. That's what exactly. it is. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I've, I've not got anything else I need to say about. Um, about no. How are we how are we going to rate this? Um, how many children's souls will you drink to stay young? Uh, we need to do both, don't we? Yes, we need to do both. Yep. Um, so I would give Hocus Pocus one. I'd give it a fifteen. Out yeah, of twenty. I'd, yeah, I agree. I'd I'd say that's fair. And I'd Hocus Pocus that. two, I'd probably give a thirteen. It's still a good movie. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's not as good, but still still perfectly acceptable Halloween fun. Yeah. Which exactly. is always good. Exactly. Yeah, so I'd I'd I I, I think that's the best way of putting it. It's two per- two marks down for not having a talking black cat. <laughs> one one mark for the bad intro scene, one mark for a lack of talking cat. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, there's no go. Dunstan checks in, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Oh dear! When are we going to talk about that? Not next, because we you you've decided we've decided on something next, haven't we? Yeah, we have. So we've had a request in to uh, watch the movie Brian and Charles. So I know nothing that. about this. Which, I, I haven't looked at it which at all. Having which is, I think is always a good a good thing. Yeah, have, I've I've watched the trailer, and it looks very much an interesting thing for us to talk about. So uh, yeah, looking forward to watching that. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed Hocus Pocus and Hocus Pocus 2. If you haven't watched them yet, there's still time. It's almost Halloween. It's it's the perfect time for it. And we hope you all have a very, very happy Halloween. You can have find us on Twitter. Spooky one. Spooky one. You can find us on Twitter at Big Boys Don't Pod. You can email us Big Boys Don't Cry podcast at gmail.com. Um, Twitter is at Big Boys Don't Pod. I got those the wrong way. Twitter. Around. Twitter. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. We're on I think, the internet. I think, I think you got it right. I think you got it right. <laughs> look, look us if up I on didn't, the internet. We're whatever. There. Yeah. We're there somewhere yeah. amongst all of the other people. Yeah. You can you can find it. <laughs> if you want to. All right. Have a very, very happy Halloween. And then normal service resumes next week with Brian and Charles. Goodbye. Goodbye.